All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm really excited um, that you are all here to listen to me talk about automated automation and testing UI components. Um, so for starters, yeah, my name is Harris. I work for DQ Systems as the principal UI engineer. <clears throat> I'm also a member of the RE Working Group. Um, and let's just get right into it. So what we're going to cover today is um, some test driven development techniques. Uh, so we're going to actually gather some requirements and actually let me back up. We're going to be building a menu button component. And we we kind of want to build it in a modular way uh, so it's nice and testable and we can reuse it in several different places in, in what we're going to build, which is like a demo app, a fake application. So we'll gather some requirements for that menu button component. We'll then write unit tests and then we'll implement the actual component. So you notice there's an interesting order there. We write our tests up front um, and I'll, I'll touch more on that in a minute. Then we will go on to uh, add some accessibility automation libraries. Um, and then we'll see what our, our new component looks like in a demo app. And then we'll look at writing some end-to-end -end tests for that demo app. And uh, lastly, we'll, we'll, we'll tie everything together with uh, CI and CD, which is um, continuous integration and continuous delivery. So test-driven development. Um, and really, I, I know people kind of argue about what's behavior-driven development versus test-driven development. All, all that really matters here for the, for the sake of this presentation is we're going to write our test cases up front um, based on some requirements that we're going to gather. And so <clears throat> the way this is going to work is that we're going we're to end up implementing all of our test cases before implementing any of the actual components. So we're going to be starting off with all of our tests failing, but that's okay. That's expected. Um, and then we're going to actually, once, once we have all of our tests failing, we're going to start implementing uh, this component and we'll know we're done once all the tests pass. I think it's a really, really useful technique. Um, it, it really helps you avoid testing your specific implementation details, and it helps you just focus on the, the raw requirements of the desired behavior. Uh, so let's look at gathering requirements. A really, really useful resource here is the RE authoring practices. Let me go up to the top. So the RE authoring practices, let's zoom in a bit. So y'all can see. So uh, the RE authoring practice is a great resource. Um, I use it a lot when I'm uh, going to implement a new widget. Um, really what it does is it describes um, kind of the purpose, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing, the purpose of a widget. So you know when you should use it, why you should use it, how you should use it. Um, and so you'll see, I have this menu button section open and it describes what it is. A menu button is a button that opens a menu, simple enough. Um, it is often styled as a typical push button with a downward pointing arrow uh, to hint that activating the button will display menu. So pretty simple. Um, we've all seen those. They're, they're pretty common. Um, and actually, before you get into anything else as far as the accessibility requirements, they link you off to some uh, demos because they know developers are like, yeah, yeah, cool. I just want to see this in action. So um, we'll look at that demo in a second. Uh, but but the, the real value here in the RE authoring practices are, are these requirements they give you. So they map out for any given widget what the expected keyboard interaction will be and what the expected attributes being used. So that's the roles, the states, and the properties, and the values. So really, really great resource to get some, some raw requirements. Obviously, implement it following this and then do some testing because um, not every user agent and assistive technology um, has full support for this. So you always want to make sure you're doing testing beyond this. But uh, let's take a look at the menu button example. There are three of them because um, there's, there's different, um, different ways you can implement a menu button. I'm going to focus on this simple uh, element.focus one um, as opposed to this are you active descendant one where you actually leave focus on the, the trigger for the menu button and update an are you active descendant attribute. But we're going to actually shift real focus um, for, the, for the sake of this demo. So. They have a demo. It's fun. You can, you can actually play around with the widget, see, uh, see what it's all about, see what you're about to embark on. Um, but I think the really awesome thing here is they actually have keyboard and attribute specific documentation for this exact example. Um, so what I like doing here is I, I take, I take this, this, these tables, this information here and, and treat them as, as raw requirements. And I, I've even sometimes just straight up copy and pasted these and use those as my test cases. Um, if you were at my CSUN talk last year, that's exactly what we did with some live coding. Um, but this year there'll be less live coding. I just want to, I want to, I want to walk us through all the stages of, of following test driven development all the way through to the, to our, our production app, if you will. So let's go over what we need to do. So they break down the keyboard support to, um, 
into the two components that actually make up this action, uh, this action menu button. We have the menu button itself and then the menu that appears when you click it. So let's, let's look at the menu button keyboard interaction. When we hit down arrow, space, or enter, we're going to open the menu and move focus to the first menu item. And as a nice to have, we'll, we'll hit up arrow on it and move focus to the last menu item after opening the menu. So on the menu itself, um, enter, as you could guess, will activate the menu item. And in this case, they actually describe what they're doing here in this demo. They're actually updating this, this live action text box. Um, it also should close the menu and then return focus back to that menu button. So keyboard users uh, who, are, who are familiar with this component, they'll actually know what to do. So it's important that you follow these so it's intuitive for them. Um, escape, as you can guess, closes the menu and sets focus back to that menu button. So you, you see here when, when, we're, when we have focus inside the menu button and we do something like close the menu, um, we wanna make sure that we actually handle focus. Otherwise it's gonna get lost, brought up to the, to the top of the document and users will have to tab back down into it. So moving on, we have up arrow. Uh, so that will move focus to the previous menu item. So kind of directionally, it'll go up, up one, unless we're on the first one, in which case it cycles all the way back down to the bottom. So it creates this nice circular uh, focus sequence and to the point where you can just kind of hold down the arrow keys and it just cycles through kind of like focus trap in a modal. So inversely, the down arrow will move focus to the next menu item, unless you're on the last and it'll move it back up to the first. Um, some nice hot keys that they've added are um, home and end. Home will take you to the first menu item, no matter where you are in the menu, and end will take you to the last. I'm gonna skip over those, those optional requirements. Um, now let's look at the role states, properties, tab indexes, tab indices, I should say. Um, really what you can think of these as is all the attributes that you need to set and or uh, manipulate as your um, widget goes into various states. So ARIA has pop-up true needs to be on the button. That'll inform assistive technology that, there, that there's this pop-up that will happen um, with a click action. ARIA controls, we'll establish this relationship between the, the, the button itself and the menu via ARIA controls. And um, you'll point at the ID of the menu in that attribute value. ARIA expanded will toggle between true and false based on whether the, the menu is expanded. And on the menu itself, we have, um, we need that menu to be a list. So we're gonna use a UL here. And we need to actually have that kind of a, a similar relationship to the um, ARIA controls. We're actually gonna make sure that the menu itself is labeled by the button. So the, the actual menu element will have an ARIA label by attribute that is the ID of the button. Each of the children, uh, LI menu items, need to have a role menu item on them. And we're gonna give them tab index negative one because that will let us actually um, write our JavaScript key downs and shift focus programmatically to any given menu item based on these keyboard requirements. So that's a lot to take in, uh, but it's nice because the, the RE work, or the, um, the RE authoring practices group, they actually did all this heavy lifting for you. And uh, now you got a, a nice set of requirements, some finite requirements here. And depending on what flavor you're implementing, they might be a slightly different, but a bottom line is this is a great place to start. All right, so we just gathered our requirements via reading this document, it's awesome. So we're gonna start writing our unit tests. So um, let me actually just go into the, the real code editor here. Let's go through these, I, they're gonna look really familiar, so I'm not gonna go uh, through all of them, but uh, just so you can get an idea of, of how, we're, how we're writing this syntactically, um, don't worry too much about the specific unit testing framework I'm using here, doesn't really matter. You can use whatever you want here, just at the end of the day, we're just writing some unit tests. So. Um, I'll read this kind of like humans would. So keyboard interaction on the menu button trigger. Um, when we press down arrow, we should open the menu, move focus to the first menu item. We saw that right here at the top of this table. So what I did is I went through all those requirements and translated them into kind of contextual uh, test cases. And so what we can get now, let me go to my terminal here. Um, let me make sure it's big enough. I blew it up a lot. Yeah, okay, that should be good. So I'm gonna run my tests and I've just written them as to do. I think it's like a nice, like you can take, take a deep breath before you go out and embark on this implementation journey. And now you're like, awesome. I know exactly what I need to do. And I'll, I know when I'll be done because all these tests will be passing. So we got our to-dos. This is awesome. We're well on our way. All right. So let's, let's move on to the test implementations. Cause I know, I know you want to like, as a developer, you really, you really want to start implementing this and styling it and making it all functional. Uh, but before we get there, Let's actually focus on our um, test implementations. Um, 
I've definitely found a lot of value in doing um, things in this order because I tend to be try to cut corners almost when I implement it first and I'll, I'll be privy to the, the implementation details of my widget. And I'll like, instead of firing a, a click, I'll just call it the on click call back. And then I'm left with this maintenance nightmare uh, if I decide to rename methods or, or what have you. So it's really important to just kind of focus on this, um, this, these raw requirements because it'll allow you to refactor your component in the future. And these tests should still actually, um, pass, which is kind of the whole point of tests is when you make changes, you want to know if you've broken uh, existing functionality. So this is awesome. Let's actually, let me switch branches to, I believe it was failing. Yes. I'm switching to my failing branch. So I'm not, I'm not quite doing live coding. As you can tell, I'm just going to, going to fast forward us to uh, the future. We just time traveled to Harris having written all these tests. All right, so let's look at a few of these actual implementations. So that same one that I just went through, when you press down arrow on the menu button, we're going to open the menu and move focus to the first menu item. So what I do is I, I'm gonna mount my, my wrapper. This is, a, wrapper is kind of a terminology used in, in Enzyme, um, but what you can really think of this as is um, I'm rendering my non-existent component. Right now, I think all it does is render a div this is React, don't worry, I'm not, this isn't gonna be a very React heavy or React specific talk. Um, that's just what I happen to choose to implement it because I um, am most comfortable with that. But the, the same concepts here would apply to even writing a vanilla module. Um, you can, there's, there's a simulate um, libraries that will let you simulate uh, just vanilla JavaScript events. And so if you, if you were just binding your key downs via add event listener, you can totally do the same thing. So I render my wrapper in, in JS DOM. It's like this pseudo document kind of fake browser like environment for me that I use for testing. And um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll, I'll render that wrapper. I'll find the button, which of course is the, the menu button trigger. I'm gonna simulate an arrow down key down on it. So what I'll then do, so now that I've done that, I'm like, I, like the test says, I'm gonna expect that the menu is open and that I've moved focus to the first menu item. So, um, the property of the document um, that represents the currently focused element is document to active element. So we're going to basically make an assertion that, hey, the, the currently focused item is the first menu item. So I, I, I do wrapper.find role menu item. So see what I'm, it's important uh, what I did here with the selector because I'm actually forcing myself without even writing a specific test for it. I do have a specific test for it just in case, but I'm actually using selectors um, that are based on these requirements. Because remember when we looked at the attribute section here, it's telling us that we need menu item on the LI. So it's, it's good for like CSS and JavaScript selectors to use these attribute selectors because it kind of forces you to, uh, to follow these rules. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm asserting that the currently focused element is the first menu item. Um, the up is the exact opposite. Let's go to a couple more fun ones. Uh, yeah, here we go. So let, let's look at how we're gonna update and manipulate that already expanded attribute. So once again, I wrap or I mount my wrapper. I find that that trigger button. I simulate a click on it because that's that's pretty uh, pretty important functionality. Uh, so that's what what that's going to do is open up the menu like those requirements told me they should. Um, and then what I'm going to do is grab the aria expanded value of the button and ex expect it to be true. So I'm saying expect basically button dot get attribute aria expanded to be true. Um, and I, I have something that actually safeguards that as well to, to test the initial state being false here. Um, and let's go to a couple more fun ones. I really like writing arrow key functionality. So let's, let's look at the up arrow on the menu item. There's two, there's two fun tests here because remember, um, it should move focus to the previous menu item unless we're on the um, first, in which case it should go to the last. So I've broken that down into two separate tests because I think it's, it's nice to separate those concerns. Um, and keep in mind, I haven't written anything yet, so I'm not basing any of these tests on any implementation details, which I think is really great. So I, I render my, my um, menu button component. I find the button, I simulate the click to open the menu. Um, I then find the, the menu itself and I simulate a key down on it. Um, now, some might say, looks like you're already kind of deciding implementation. Yeah, I, I usually just use key down. So I, I assumed up front that I was, gonna, I was gonna implement this component using a key down listener. I don't think that's too, too bad of a, of a corner to cut. Um, and then similar to the, um, the, the currently focused element assertion I made above, I'm gonna say expect document.active element to be the first menu item. So I went from the second to the first here. And I'm gonna go from the first to the last. Um, 
that too is hard coded, but I, I just decided up front that I was going to render three um, children to that menu. So there, that gives you an idea of, of what these unit test implementations look like. Let's see all the red X's here. And don't worry, you're supposed to see them. Usually seeing failing tests will trigger you to be sad or, or, up, or a little frustrated, but here I'm actually expecting it. So yeah, as you can see, we got nothing but failing tests. This is awesome. This is what we were supposed to do. So let's go back to my readme. Now let's do some implementation. Um, so I'm gonna check out our new branch, fast forward us a little bit. Let's get check out, uh, I think I call it passing. So let's look at our component now side by side with the tests. Cause that's really how I, how I started implementing this. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking that it, this is the order in which I implemented this project. <laughs> I wouldn't do a talk on it if I didn't follow those rules. So um, let's just, let's just translate um, each of these test cases. I won't go through them all to um, the corresponding code in the implementation. So keyboard interaction, actually, you know what I like to do? I'm going to start us off with role states and properties. I usually like focusing on, on the, the initial state, the initial render first. So that is the order in which I did this. So the element that opens the menu has role equals button. Actually, it just has a role button in implicit or explicit. Uh, so I was being nice here. Um, I'm, I'm looking for a button or an element with role button and I'm expecting it to exist. So usually I'd actually, I'd probably actually just go with this. I'd force, I'd force people to use this widget using a button, but um, I wrote the test just based on the requirements in, in the RE authoring practices. So I didn't want to decide anything up front. So let's go, look, let's see what we're doing there. Back down here in the render, um, I'm rendering a wrapper just to make styling easy for whoever's using this. Um, usually when you have something like a, a drop down or whatever you want to call this menu, you want an offset relative parent so you can style it nicely and you'll position it absolutely right underneath that button. So I added a wrapper and then right, right off the bat, I, I rendered this button, which is the exact corresponding code that I wrote based on this test. Uh, so the second requirement is that the, this button element has Aria has pop-up set to either menu or true. So the second thing I did was write Aria has pop-up equals true here. Got to let assistive technology know what, what kind of component they're dealing with. Next up, we have um, the menu itself, as well as the Aria expanded attribute. So I, I set, I'm like, okay, here, this is a stateful attribute. So when we say role states and properties, Aria expanded is a state because it is updated based on the state of the component. So I decided right off the bat, okay, this is React. React's very uh, state friendly. So I'm like, all right, let's set our initial state to, to false of expanded, and then we'll update it um, based on uh, what it previously was. So I, have a, I already wrote a toggle expanded um, method because like I said, I actually have all my requirements up front before I even uh, wrote this. So I actually know everything I'm gonna need support. So I actually am able to develop this um, more rapidly because I know everything that I'm gonna need to implement. All right, so let's look at that. I'm setting Aria uh, expanded to the expanded state and, um, and then we're going on to the uh, UL, the role menu. So let's go to that. Do, do, do. All right, role states and properties. Has role menu. Remember we're in a describe statement that's talking about the menu. So describes kind of give your, your test some context. Um, so right, right off the bat, I know I needed to, to make a UL and add a role equals menu attribute to it. Um, and that the children need to be rendered with role equals menu item. So I actually wrote a little tiny LI component that actually adds the required um, attributes and properties to this. So I, I've set up um, myself with some refs. All that is is, is a way for me to um, gather element references so I can actually manipulate focus. I give it a role equals menu item. And I give it, like I said, uh, like the requirements that I should say, uh, tab index equals negative one, so I can programmatically focus it. Pretty simple there. Um, so that's kind of the the initial render, right? I've, I've gone through like kind of the, the initial states and, and the, the base attributes that I need. So now let's look at some keyboard interactivity. Back up on the button, let's see. So down arrow on the button. So let's go to this button component. We can kind of follow um, its events through this. So we have an on click and an on key down. We want to look at the key downs here. So on button key down. I check if it's arrow down or arrow up. Otherwise, I don't care about the key press and I won't do anything. Um, if I do actually get an arrow up, arrow down, I want to prevent default so I don't uh, scroll the page. 
because th this, these key presses are actually doing something more than the browser default behavior of, of scrolling up and down. Um, so I use my trusty toggle expanded uh, method that I wrote up front to, um, to toggle that already expanded. And actually, um, I'd recommend using, uh, like I said, using attribute selectors in your CSS. Uh, rather than toggling some active class, I'd recommend just um, making the menu displayed by uh, based on the aria expanded value. So display none when it's aria expanded false, display block when it's aria expanded true. Pretty simple. Um, and, and once that uh, expanding state transition is complete, I then um, focus uh, a menu item. So I wrote a little focus uh, item method, and that takes an index an index of the of the menu item to be focused. So let's look at the logic we use there. All right, actually that's the wrong method. All right, so we're we're saying okay if if I press down, go to the zero width, which is the first menu item, like the requirement says right there, and then otherwise go to the last because I know otherwise means arrow up, which says last menu item. Awesome, pretty simple. Um, I've already went over how we implemented that actual test, and here's how we implemented the actual functionality. So that's it for the keyboard interaction on the button. Um, I, do, I do have a click listener. Um, like I said, you might have to add some requirements for, for usability um, in addition to uh, what the ARIA authoring practices say. Um, in this case, I've added a, a click listener, obviously. So when, when you click the button as a mouse user or with the keyboard, you will, um, you'll get that toggle expanded and, and uh, focus the menu item. So let's look on button click. I toggle expanded, so it's going from false to true. So hidden to displayed, and I'm focusing the first menu item. Nice and simple. All right, so let's go to the keyboard interaction of the actual menu button menu. So enter should activate whatever menu item you're on, close the menu, and set focus to the menu button. Let's look at that. Oh, perfect. On menu, click. Um, and then let's see, as well as enter. So enter kind of acted like a click for me. Uh, you want to you do the same thing for both. So I've, I've bound a click listener and I listen for enter and call the same exact method in both cases. So on menu, click gets called. And then I make sure that we're actually, we've clicked an item. Um, if, if the implementer has accidentally added weird padding or margins, actually specifically margins, and they click outside of a menu item, I just want to do nothing basically. So that's what, that's what this code does. Um, otherwise, I want to select the clicked item and then toggle expanded because by the very fact that I've clicked a menu item, it means we're expanded, so I know I need to collapse it so I can toggle it. And then like the requirements told me to do, I focus the menu button. Pretty awesome stuff. All right, so let me move on. Um, I could go through this all day, but I actually have more to get through, more exciting stuff. So now that we've implemented this, let's actually see if we have some, some green check marks, some test passing. Drum roll, show me some green, please. Yes, my one test suite passed and all 20 of my assertions uh, passed. So looks like we're doing great. Um, I actually recommend using a testing library that has a, a watch mode. So what I'll do is I'll, like I said, I, I start off with all the tests right, uh, written and they're all failing. So I'll, I'll set up my yarn test watch and it will keep retesting as I save anything. So as I, as I implement this component, It'll retest and I'll just keep bouncing back and forth. And eventually I said, oh, cool. Looks like all the requirements were met. We call it a day now. So let's move on. Now that we have all of our tests passing, let's look at some accessibility automation libraries. All right. So yeah, what's an accessibility automation library? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it is kind of what it sounds. It's any library that automates accessibility testing. So uh, a linter is like a static analysis tool. Um, if you're a coder or have been around code at all, you might be familiar with, with the term linting. Um, every language has one. Uh, an example that's not accessibility specific would be um, pretend you have a JavaScript file in strict mode and you have a typo. So I said var foo equals document dot element by ID foo. And then on the next line, I wanted to click that foo element. So I did foo dot click. And then my linter right in my IDE or if I run the lint script will say, fo f o is not defined and i would go oh yeah f o o there we go um now there's some really cool linting that's accessibility specific uh the one i'm going to touch down on today is jsx alley because i have implemented this with uh jsx and react 
Um, but there are, there are tons out there. I highly recommend checking out whatever framework you're using, even if it's vanilla. Um, check out what linters are available uh, for accessibility because it helps you helps catch that low hanging fruit while you're in development. You don't want to find out about these issues after you push, or even worse, after you've merged. Hopefully into a development server. Hopefully not production. But um, it's always nice to get a slap on the wrist right away. So an example of that would be me rendering div with an invalid role value. So it actually has, it knows what the uh, valid roles are and it will yell at you if you um, use, use one that doesn't exist. And what I mean by yell is let's, let's actually look at this in action. Let's go down to my render. Let's actually use the exact example from the readme. Role equals bananas. And you'll see, I have, I have some immediate feedback. And let me describe that. So I have red squiggly lines, but that, that's, that's just a visual indication. We actually have uh, some, some textual information here too. So it's saying um, non-interactive elements should, be, uh, should not be assigned keyboard or mouse events. And okay, there it goes, it needed to update. And it also says elements with ARIA roles must use a valid non-abstract ARIA role. So it actually knows the difference between roles that are allowed to be rendered and abstract roles, and in this case, non-existent roles. And you'll notice actually, as soon as I, so this, as soon as I go back to menu, it stops yelling at me. And if I remove menu, that's where we'll get that, that same issue which, where it's saying, hey, you're binding events to this, to this thing without a role, you're probably doing something wrong. You're either binding it to the wrong element or you're missing a role. So it's a great way to say, oh yeah, oops, I forgot to, forgot to add that role. Um, it does all sorts of cool stuff too. It will, um, what's another thing? It will, it, a basic accessibility should be like a link without text, right? We've all seen that. Um, Implementers put a background image on an anchor, forget to add an ARIA label or some, some off-screen text inside of it. And um, AT users will get link blank, basically, which is terrible. So let me just do ahref. Let's go to Google. Oops, google.com. Let me just close this anchor out. I'll, there we go. So it actually detected that for me. It says, hey, anchors must have content. Um, and it actually tells you why. You can, you can always click on these. So if you don't have a fancy editor, you can still do these. I've actually set it up uh, in this project to run these, these lint rules um, before you commit. I'll show you that at the end. Um, but I highly, highly recommend using um, these accessibility automation libraries because they make your life really easy. So the second <clears throat> type of accessibility automation library is uh, I want to talk about is Axcore. Um, I work for DQ and DQ has created this. I think I saw Wilco was here. He's, he's Mr. Axcore. Um, it's a really awesome tool. It's free to use, open source. Um, it, there's a browser extension for it that you can get for Chrome or Firefox. Um, there's all sorts of fun implementations of it. I'm gonna show off uh, just Axe. It'll allow me to uh, run Axe in that, that JS DOM environment that I was talking about using some, some nice syntactical sugar uh, around just assertions. So let's look at that specific test. And actually, I've actually over the years found out a little trick. Um, and let me explain that in a minute. So let me check out uh, passing with X. So now I've added one more test and that's it. And it actually is going to run X in every single state that I've tested. So I, I've, been, I've been running X in my unit tests a lot and um, I'd, I'd kind of like get it into various states deliberately and then run X. But then I was like, wait a minute, unit testing's already getting <clears throat> my widget into all the various states that it needs to be. So for example, I get it, I open up the, the menu and have focus on one of the menu items. And so I'm like, oh, perfect time to run X. So a lot of unit testing frameworks or libraries have a hook in to run something right after each test. So a perfect time for me to run X is after each of these tests. So what I'm gonna do is run X or run my tests again. And what it's gonna do is, get the widget into whatever state I needed for, for the uh, RE authoring practice requirement, and then I'm gonna run X. So let's do this. Let's run our tests again. And you won't see anything different because this is an after each hook rather than a named assertion like children have tab index. Um, but let me show you how it's working because it's really gonna run through all the tests and run this right after. So let me just throw a console log. X clean. Woo! So we run that, you're gonna see it log one time for every, every single test that I've written. Bam, 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 bam. There we go. Woo! Lots of Axe cleans happening. Um, 
And that's a great way to, uh, once again, that the ax will actually catch even more than, than a linter can because it's actually analyzing stuff like color contrast and, and all sorts of styly stuff like that. And it, it, there's a bit of an overlap, I should say, between JSX Alley and Axe, and it, Axe will catch those same things that I was talking about. Axe knows what valid roles are, and Axe will yell at you about that in the form of, of a, a JavaScript error. So you'll get nice red <laughs> errors here, immediate feedback when you um, create an accessibility issue. So having this in place from the start is great because, yeah, I've implemented this component my first pass. Maybe it turns out we get some new requirements for it, needs to do all sorts of other things. Now I have these baseline um, features tested and I have um, accessibility automation baked in here. So it will actually, maybe even if I follow, if I follow the ARIA authoring practice rules, I might actually create um, additional accessibility issues. So having this in place from the start is awesome. It'll keep me in check. All right, I think I'm good on time. So that's AxeCore. Definitely uh, hit it up if you need some accessibility automation in your life. Um, so, Automated tests definitely get your uh, component into all these states and you should all you should test uh, for accessibility in all those various states. So that's cool and all we've we've really just been looking at code. Uh, but let's like, let's take a look at our component in action. So what I did was built a really basic demo app. I will spin up the server for right now, I run my dev server. Let's let it build real quick. And uh, a little plug to something I work on. I, I built this demo app using um, a pattern library at DQ that I work on called Cauldron React. Um, it actually made, made building this app pretty easy. I didn't have to do much styling myself. So we're looking at a pretty basic website, let's say. It's a single page app the way I've written it. We have a home page, an about page, and a contact us page. Um, let's take a look at the home page because that's going to be the first, first type of, of, of call to our, our menu button component. So in code, let me go to the home page in the demo app. So I'm importing my menu button component that we just got done testing vigorously. And now I'm calling it. I'm instantiating this menu button class with a, <clears throat> excuse me, some, some props. I'm passing in action one, action two, action three. And I, um, I have a hook for when I make a selection of one of those items and I set this action log, which really just means I'm gonna populate this, this log. So let's start messing around with the keyboard because I like, I like testing that out first. Um, so yeah, look at that. I'm, I'm holding down the down arrow key and what it's doing is exactly what my test said it would do. I go to the next uh, menu item, AKA the, the one that's down from it um, visually, and then I will hit the down arrow on the last one and it goes back up to the top. So let's see if the up arrow does the same thing. Woo, awesome. Up arrow does the same thing. In fact, I actually just saw, just noticed a bug in my code. I actually scrolled the document when I did that too. So how I'd fix that would be um, adding something to my component here. So let's look, let's look, I actually didn't even plan on this. This is awesome. So key down of my menu should actually prevent default on arrow down and arrow up. Look at that. I really didn't plan on that. <laughs> I actually let that slip in all my preparation. That's awesome. So there we go. So testing manually is obviously a, a great thing for usability. So there's an example. All right, cool. It looks like I'm not scrolling anymore. Hooray. So my arrow keys work. Let's see if selecting works with the keyboard. So remember that that's enter should activate the menu item, close the menu, return focus to the, um, the button. And in this case, with my implementation on this specific page, I'm doing some extra stuff on selection. What I'm gonna do is actually populate this action log. So I'm gonna hit action two and look at that. My focus is back on the button. I've set this up like a, a log live region. So politely, a screener will announce that the action has just taken place. Um, I just did that for fun. Uh, and let's try this out with a mouse too. Let's make sure it works because it should work for everybody. So it looks like I'm, I'm opening it with by clicking on the actions button and I'm able to click on some menu items and it's populating the log. Awesome. Let's clear that log out. Let's look at another, another type of implementation of our menu button. So we have a pretty basic um, send us a message on the contact page. It's just a, basically your, your everyday email form. Um, I can send an email. Hello, CSUN. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm bad at spelling today. And I can send it and it says message received. Awesome, it's a fake. It's not actually sending anyone an email. Um, we can do fun stuff with this, with this, action, with this um, menu button here. So I have a menu button in the top corner of this send us a message form. Um, you can, it's a common use case for a menu button to have like, you know, some additional action. So what I did was I souped this form up with a saved draft functionality. So if I'm in the middle of something and I need to go get lunch, I will, uh, I'll be able to click 
our uh, menu button, open up that menu, and select the save draft menu item. And what that does is close the menu button. And actually, I'm going to do something non-standard. So I'm actually manipulating focus myself because I have, um, I have some content change that I want the user to be, be immediately aware of. So what I did was focus that save draft section. And now you can actually look at your drafts. It has a subject, a message. You can use it or you can discard it. So let me actually clear the form, which is the second um, menu item uh, in this actions menu button thing. And I'm going to click enter. And now that I've cleared the form, I'm going to say use draft. And look at that. It took the drafts data, populated the form, focused the, the first um, input field, the subject in this case. And voila, we have some, uh, some functioning actions menu stuff happening here. Um, that's not, that's not all. It, it's not all about the, not all about our, uh, our menu button here. We have some, some basic form validation. If I try to send a message without a subject, it will, um, it'll provide some validation feedback to the user. I hit send shifts focus back up to that subject, uh, input. I have some, um, error messages rendered. Let me actually zoom in here. Sorry about that. Some error messages rendered. Um, and we can take a look at the actual code. I have aria invalid set to true. I have required denoted on the input, and I also have aria described by the generated uh, ID for this error message. So that way, when a user hits this with a screen reader, it will say subject invalid, hence the aria invalid equals true. Subject is required. So that's, there's a bunch of functionality here, right? Um, not, just, not just our component. And I think this is where we can move on to end-to-end -to -end tests. So I've covered the absolute crap out of our menu button from all angles based on accessibility requirements and maybe some usability ones that I've added. Um, and that's great. I've tested it though, just in sheer isolation. I don't know how it works with, with other parts of my app. Um, so I think I've done a good job. I've gotten some good coverage. I'm confident in, in the functionality of that menu button itself, but I'm not necessarily confident in how it interacts with, with my other components. And maybe I can compose it with some other components that I'm testing and, um, I think, that, I think that's a good way of approaching it. You test your, your, your components in isolation, and then you can write some, some overall, some general end-to-end -end tests to test how they play with each other and other things that the app needs to do. Um, so it's not necessarily specific to components. It's just um, specific to what, what you want your app to do, right? So I do have some end-to-end -end tests here. Let me um, check out master. Uh, I'll commit that those changes later. <laughs> um, okay, so I have my master branch checked out. Um, I have now fast forwarded us to a state of this repository that has a bunch of end-to-end -end tests. And what I'm gonna do is use a library called Puppeteer to actually spin up my app in a real Chromium instance. So it's actually rendering the thing we were just looking at here in Chrome, which is what I'm, what I'm showing it here, showing it off here in, and it's going to um, automate a ton of stuff. So let's look and see what I've automated here. All right, so like I said, this is a single page app and um, focus should be retained in a single page app, meaning um, it shouldn't, shouldn't stay on a menu item. Users should know if the um, route has changed and um, I, wanna, I wanna actually focus the, the main content if you uh, click on one of these, these top bar navigation items. So I've written a test for that. So it's, it's, it reads pretty nicely um, that this is just the Puppeteer API. I, uh, before all these global tests, I spin up the browser. I tell it to go to the homepage, localhost one, two, three, four. And uh, I make sure it's loaded by waiting for my main content to be rendered. All right, so my first test says, manages focus on route transition. And you'll see I'm actually just using Jest here for these two. So there's not a huge difference um, of the feel when I'm writing unit tests versus when I'm writing end-to-end uh, -end tests. So what I do is I click the, uh, looks like the, the second um, menu item. So it looks like I'm going to about just because I'm already on the home page. I want to make sure I transition. And then I make an assertion that the main is focused. So Puppeteer lets me evaluate JavaScript in that, that real Chromium instance that, it's that I'm driving here. And so I say, Hey, let's let's make sure that the document active element is the role main thing, and so I expect this variable main is focused to be true. Uh, similarly, I have a skip link on this in this app, and I want to make sure that the skip link actually is, is managing focus too. So I focus the skip link because a skip link is a funny thing in, in Puppeteer wouldn't let me just click click it while it's display none. So the skip link actually goes from display none to display block 
um, based on whether it's focused or not. So I first I focus it to make it visible so we can actually click it and then I click it and then I run the same exact assertion. I expect the main content to be focused. Um, another cool thing you can do um, because uh, a lot of these accessibility automation libraries are, are very um, singletons in terms of state. AxCore will, will test your, your, your current state very thoroughly, um, but it's up to you to get your, your um, app into different states. So one thing that people often miss are um, hovered and focused states of links. So we have, a, we have an actual end-to-end -end test that, that forces us to um, ensure we have a good enough color contrast, not just in the initial state, but um, in the hovered and focused states. So I'll actually show what it's like to fail that here at the end of this talk, but um, I've, I've set it up now to have a, a nice contrast. You get, a, you get a focus ring and you actually get a color change uh, on hover and focus. So um, I have an N10 test that actually um, forced me to make that accessible. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I will go to the contact one because I just went over all the, the interaction heavy things that happen on that page. Um, and I, I wanna show you guys what, what all I've, I've been able to test. So, I go to the home page again, I click the contact link, and I wait for the contact actions. And um, right off the bat, I'm, I'm like I just talked about Axe being stateful, or being a singleton in terms of state. I test, I, I assert that I'm Axe clean in the default state. We like saying hashtag Axe clean. Um, and I urge you to call it the same thing. <laughs> um, and then we have all the, all the different form states that I was showing off. So I, uh, it, I get the form into all of it, all the various states that it has in all these tests. And similar to my end to end tests, <clears throat> or sorry, to my unit tests, I'm doing the same thing in my end to end tests. So I'm just running Axe on the page and I'm asserting that, that Axe returns zero violations. So that, that's the case for the state in which I clear the form, in which I um, have some validation on the form, and I focus the subject field when, when various um, uh, menu button axes have taken place. So. I click the, the menu button trigger, that's doing this. And then I click the second one, clear. And then I'm making sure that I focus the subject field when I clear the form, which it does. So that gives you an idea of what you can do with end-to-end -end tests. Um, as you can see, like, it's, it's not all about what your, your single component does. It's nice to test um, what, your, what your app's doing. And I think a good place to do that is an end-to-end -end test. All right. So let's see what these look like. And I can actually show what these look like by, um, by default, Puppeteer will run headless, which means you won't see anything that's happening. It's just running in an invisible browser that you won't see. And that's usually what you do for speed and everything. But I'm actually going to tell it to show us what's happening. It's gonna be pretty fast, I apologize for that. I tried to slow down a bit um, without having my, my test fail and timeout. So I gave it a 700 milli, 750 millisecond uh, slow-mo option so it actually we can, we'll be able to kind of see what's happening but um, I've already described what, what I'm driving the browser to do so uh, let's take a look um, and let me make sure I've built my code first cue the Jeopardy music all right and then we'll go ahead and run our end-to-end -end test now so I, I've actually baked in my unit tests and my end-to-end -end tests in the same thing so all I have to do is run uh, yarn test and you'll see that I have a bunch of tabs that will start to open those are for all my different test files and uh, It's it's right now. It's automating all these tests and you'll see a bunch of you know things being clicked focus being shifted um, And that, that's manifested through my uh, through all these assertions that I'm making in the intent tests So that's pretty awesome And it looks like let's look at the output that I have all my tests passing so I'm, I'm hashtag acts clean the default state of the home page I uh, make sure that my scrollable log element has a log role. I make sure that the scrollable log element is focusable so keyboard users can scroll it. Um, I make sure that it gets populated uh, with, with the performed actions. Like that's, that's the additional functionality that I'm speaking of. It's not just all about the widget itself. Now that the widget lives somewhere else, let's, let's test that it does what, what this app needs it to do. So, whew, that was a lot of testing. A lot, a lot of testing here. Uh, but testing is awesome, and like I said, it helps keep you in check, uh, your future self in check. So if you go around hacking around and breaking things, you'll have tests there to, uh, to tell you that you broke it. Um, and there's all sorts of awesome code coverage tools that you can use um, to point out places that maybe you forgot to write a test. So if I go back to this and add some new functionality that don't necessarily break some tests, um, I still need to test that new functionality. So coverage reports will tell me, hey, you're missing, you know, these five lines of code have, have never been touched in the, in the tests. All right, 
I'm going to quickly I have enough time to show this off for a couple couple more minutes. Um, I have this project set up with a thing called Circle CI that uh, helps me um, help helps ensure that this project stays healthy. And what it what it actually does is uh, run all these things that I've been um, showing off. It will install the dependencies, build the build the app, um, and then run the tests. And that's in CI. So what I can do is is set my um, my uh, repository up to run those whenever I create a pull request. So let's create a pull request and see if we can purposely break something and, and, and show you what, what continuous integration really helps you do. So let me go into app.css and let me edit this file because I'm feeling really rogue and weird today. I'm just gonna edit stuff right in uh, GitHub, which <laughs> I don't recommend. Um, so let's do this. I'm gonna update app.css. I'm gonna create a new branch, propose a new file change to my teammates. I'm gonna make a pull request out of it. And as soon as I actually cr create that commit and push it, um, CircleCI is already running these builds and tests. Let's see if I've broken anything. And it is queued, so I might not get it immediately. But what will eventually happen, uh, just so we don't have to wait on it, is, okay, it's, it's checking it out, cool. Um, I'll, I'll try to describe what's happening, but uh, basically it, it's basically checking out my code. It's gonna restore some cache from the dependencies, then it's gonna do those things that I described. Build the app, run the tests. You'll see a bunch of other uh, output here in my pull request. Um, this kind of ties more into the CD. So I said I was gonna cover CI, which is the circle CI thing, obviously. Um, continuous integration, I'm running my tests for every commit. I'll get nice feedback in my GitHub pull requests if I, if I break stuff. You can um, even set it up so, to prevent merges when you do have a failing build, which I highly recommend. Um, a little thing I like to call uh, no merge till hashtag axe clean. You can say, hey, teammate, I'm not clicking this merge button till you till your uh, axe clean or all your tests are passing. So let's see. Uh, what I did, uh, the code change, is I removed that, um, that contrast on the uh, focus and hover. And it looks like we have invalid contrast. So Axe actually saved the day here. And Axe ran the, those two assertions. Remember how I said I wanted to test um, various states of those footer links. So I actually simulated a hover. I simulated a focus state. And sure enough, Axe kept me in check and said, hey, hey, you don't want to remove that. Or you want to make sure you have uh, sufficient color contrast according to WCAG. So um, my continuous integration can actually save the day here. And um, maybe to a code reviewer, I know this change looks kind of obvious, but maybe a change you make uh, isn't as obvious and it's nice to use, use automation to your advantage. Um, now the CD side of things, the continuous delivery side of things is uh, a little thing I like to call Netlify. There's plenty of other ways to do it. You can do it yourself. Um, Netlify is a really, really easy thing to get up and running. Um, and actually I've set this project up with it and it will actually deploy previews of the, um, of the current branch. So I just made those footer link changes and check it out. The, the browser default, um, hover and focus states take over. And we have, look at that. We have uh, a dark blue on a pretty much black footer. So that's not contrasting enough. And so Axe told me that. So another great thing about continuous delivery is if, if you wanna see your, your teammates change in action, you wanna test some things out because the code looks fine, but maybe you wanna pop a screener around and make sure that they tested it. Um, Netlify or whatever continuous delivery you're using will help you catch all of that. All right. So I'm pretty much done. I want to thank everyone for, for listening to me talk about automation today. Um, and uh, I've been Harris. I think we're going to go to questions now. Yep, we're going to go to questions. Um, we have about eight minutes, so we'll try to fit in as many as we can. Uh, but I think the number one question was, uh, can is this um, GitHub project public or can it be made public so um, our, our participants can get hands on it? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm actually getting getting clearance for that right now. Um, I assume I'll have an answer for that uh, shortly. So I, I assume in all likelihood it will be. At the very least, I will um, open source this this README, and I'm pretty sure I'll be able to do the whole project. Awesome. Thank you. And we will, um, you know, if and when we get that confirmation, we're happy to send the link to the project around in the slides and recording email. Awesome. All right. Um, here's one. It, if the focus cycles endlessly, is there a way to tell when you've gotten to the end of the list so you could stop exploring once you've encountered all the options? 
Um, I think it depends. Um, I'm not sure uh, every screen reader will actually tell you that, but when you do enter the menu for the first time, it tells you how many menu items there are. So you can infer that. And um, if you were traversing, yeah, I think the, the only way to tell would be to, to notice that, okay, it said there's three items. I just went to the third and now I must be back at the first because the, the text of the first menu item is right out. So I think your results may vary based on assistive technology actually. Great. And quick question, um, what, which editor were you using in this demonstration? Ah, good question. I was using uh, VS Code. And I think, I think I've used the basic pretty much, I, I don't have any fancy settings other than um, the uh, ESLint plugin. And that allowed me to get that uh, nice immediate feedback in my IDE when I do roll equals bananas. Um, that, that's what allowed me to get that, that live as I type um, feedback with my linter. Uh, other than that, I think I'm using the, the stock syntax theme. So this is pretty much VS code out of the box. Great. Uh, what testing infrastructure do you recommend for using Axe to test React components? The traditional uh, model of Selenium, something else? Good question. So I think it depends on what you're testing. So um, I think I, I used what I would recommend for, for both types of testing. So um, I was using, for the unit test, I was using Jest. Jest Axe, which actually I, I should have actually gone over that. Um, let me go into my test utils and my setup tests. I'm actually extending Jest stock expect with um, some additional things that Jest Axe provides and that will allow me to make an assertion of, um, let me just show you, expect and then a thing inside of, inside of expect to have no violations, which is just a shortcut for awaiting acts.results or awaiting access results and, and asserting that results.violations.length is zero, but it's a, it's a nice um, shortcut to that. So I'm using Jest, I'm using Enzyme to mount my components. Um, Jest, I believe under the hood is using JS DOM. So that's the, that's the headless browser that's being used. Um, and uh, Jest comes with the reporter, it comes with the coverage tool and um, it comes with the assertion library. So uh, pretty much just Jest, Jest, Axe, and Enzyme for this, for the unit tests. And for um, for end-to-end -end tests, if you want to do full browser, I think you said Selenium. I think Selenium's great. Puppeteer's awesome. I haven't had an, enough time to play much with Playwright, but that seems really cool. There's a ton of awesome real browser-like things that you can drive. And I, I think it just depends on uh, what your needs are in the given project uh, a bit to, to help you make that decision. But I know Selenium's been around for the longest, and a lot of people are... are uh, already writing tests in that and there's, I don't see any problem with that. I just prefer Puppeteer because I'm more familiar with the API. Awesome, thank you. Uh, does the Axe library have to be imported in the actual web page code for someone to be able to run E2E tests? Uh, yes. So I have a pretty basic um, helper here called Axe. And what I do basically is inject Axe into the page um, if it's not already there. So uh, what that looks like is I uh, read the contents of the file and inject it into the page. And then I evaluate, I do page.evaluate, which I, I used in the end-to-end -end tests too, I showed everyone. And that was um, a way for me to execute JavaScript in the, in the script of the actual page, not just in my test script. So uh, here you'll see I return axe.run. So then when I call this, I can say await oh, X results and it just does it for me. So I wrote a little helper so I didn't have to keep writing this, but yeah, I did have to manually inject X into the page. Um, I believe there, there's, a, there's a library called X Puppeteer that, that does some of that for you, but I did kind of want to show everyone how that would work uh, manually. Super. Um, how do you decide which tests should be coded in unit and which ones in E2E? Yeah, it's a really, <laughs> really tough question that I'm probably not uh, smart enough to answer. Um, just based on my experience, I, I tend to to break it up like I did today. I tend to test my individual pieces in unit tests, and there might be a little overlap. So effort-wise, maintenance-wise, maybe that's not the best um, approach to what I did, but I, I tend to, like I said, I test my, my individual components and widgets in isolation. Um, like I said, I was using Cauldron React. Each Cauldron React component has its own uh, set of uh, suite of unit tests, uh, but when I, when I when I composed all those components together into this app, I decided to, uh, that it was a good place to, um, to run my end-to-end -end tests for demo purposes. Uh, I will say I probably could have tested all the things that I did in my unit tests uh, technically by, by mounting uh, an enzyme 
this whole app. Um, but I kind of like doing stuff in the real browser uh, so you can see what's going on. It feels more real, but um, I will say I could probably accomplish everything that I tested just in unit tests. So there's a ton of articles. People are super opinionated on it. Um, I don't have too many strong opinions there. Uh, I just do whatever, whatever I feel, whatever I feel is right. Uh, I don't think you can get it wrong. I think, I think um, inversely of what I said, I could have tested everything in end to end tests. It's all about performance and timing. Um, but yeah, I think, I think as long as you're getting some, some good test coverage and you have some accessibility specific tests, that's all I care about. And you're doing good if you're doing that. Sorry, I don't have a good answer for that question. Oh, that's great. Okay. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Um, in regards to the up down arrow uh, that to go throughout the menus, how do you go to the menu items which are placed vertically slash horizontally? Is it the same as up and down arrows? Ah, uh, so I think I assume we're going to be talking about like sub menus and stuff. Um, you can actually refer to the ARIA authoring practices for that because I think it, it depends on what widget you're using. Um, so off the top of my head, yes, it does actually make a difference. So I think if you have like a, your standard um, vertically oriented menu that has uh, sub menus, you'll actually down arrow through the top level items and then you'll use the right arrow key press to open that menu and you'll shift focus into the sub menu. And then once again, you're using, um, you're using uh, up and down arrow to go through it. But like your question was asking was the vertical ones. And uh, that would be more like a menu bar that I clicked on. And, and you, you're absolutely right. When, when a screen reader user hits that menu bar, they'll actually know to use left and right. Um, I think some people code it to use both. So down and right, do the same exact thing. Um, but you can, you can obviously refer to uh, the RU authoring practices and they'll actually tell you everything you need to know about, um, about these, these key presses that you're doing.